Testing, one, two, three. I don't know what has happened. Testing, testing. Oh, there, now it should be there. Sorry, again, we are in the prospectus, page 29, going over to page 30. We're on page 30 now. We're dealing with the three um, issues of, uh, that have to be resolved in order for the, the CLC to consider the issue of termination of church fellowship to be a matter resolved by between us and the Wells and ELS. We've covered verse or number 1A um, on page 30 of the prospectus, ambiguity concerning the nature of our difference. Now we're talking about B, ambiguity concerning the distinction between passages which apply to weak brothers and those which apply to false teachers. So passages dealing with weak brothers tell us to admonish them. Passages dealing with false teachers, like Romans 16, 17, but there are others, 1 John uh, 4, 1 through 3, but also Jesus' words in Matthew 7 where he says, Beware of false teachers who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. In regards to false teachers, Scripture tells us to stay away from them, avoid them, beware of them. Um, so you cannot take passages that deal with weak brothers whom we are to admonish because Ultimately, we're all weak, right? We don't all have a perfect understanding. We don't all have a perfect practice. So we, through weakness, we might say something or do something that is not in accord with Scripture, but then we admonish one another. You can't take those passages dealing with weak brothers and apply them to false teachers as though you're supposed to be admonishing false teachers. What you're supposed to do with false teachers is stay away from them. That's where the Wells and the ELS messed up back in the 50s, right? Because they recognized that the Missouri Synod was a causer of divisions and offenses, that is, false teachers. And they said, even though that's the case, we're going to continue to admonish them until we determine it's no longer useful to do so. It's not the exact wording, but that's what it amounts to. And that's when the founding fathers of the COC said, we can't stay then because that's not what Scripture teaches. And then they form the CLC. Should I? I understand from like a human point of view why they do that, but from biblical, that's where. Right. And that, you know, every false teaching is always an elevation of, of man's thoughts over God's thoughts. Um, and it doesn't matter what it's in regard to, it can be in regard to why some are saved and others aren't, which is pretty significant teaching of Scripture. Man comes up with reasonable uh, conclusions about that, but God didn't say it. God says quite the opposite, that he desires all men to be saved, and yet some, by their own willful decision, aren't. Um, but that's what's happening here, too. Somebody's thinking, no, it's it's reasonable for us when somebody is, is teaching falsely to, to stay with them and, and keep correcting them. We might do that in a job, right? So you have somebody who hires on, let's say he's a carpenter. Oh, let's, let's go even worse than that, electrician. Hires on to be an electrician and he messes up here. And you say, hey, you messed up here. This is how you do this. Yeah, yeah, okay, I know. And then he goes to the next one and does it the exact same wrong way. And you say, hey, remember that? And he goes, yeah, 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 whatever. And then he goes to the next one and messes it up. You might keep doing that with, with someone, especially if it's a friend or a relative, and keep in teaching them, even though he's obviously not a 
true electrician when he keeps messing it up. But that's not what God tells us to do with his word. What God tells us to do is when someone is a false teacher, causing divisions and offenses through their doctrine, that is contrary to the doctrine of Scripture, you're to avoid it in, in, in matters of fellowship. Um, so C, ambiguity concerning the interpretation of Romans 16, 17 in particular, which speaks only on the subject of separation from false teachers, not admonition of weak brothers. So you have, you have these words, Mark, those who cause divisions and offenses, and avoid. Very simple. And scripture makes it clear. The dot, dot, dot here is those who are causing divisions and offenses. That is false teaching. What the Wells and ELS did back in the 50s, and in all honesty, they've continued to do it in practice, is they've inserted a word here. Admonish. So they've taken the word that deals with weak brothers. Man, my brain is getting kind of sloppy here. They've taken a word that deals with weak brothers. And then they've inserted it into how you deal with false teachers. And we don't get to do that with God's word. And it's important. And, you know, a lot of people will say, hey, this is just a minor issue of Scripture. How can this be minor? How can the very doctrine that teaches us how important it is to maintain true doctrine be minor? Didn't Jesus say, if you continue in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free? This is not a minor doctrine, no matter how many times people say it. This is, this is a very important doctrine. So, you cannot insert admonition in here, and any attempt to do so pollutes the very tool, doctrine, that God gives us to guard against believing um, false doctrine ourselves. And I'll say it again like I did last week. No one was ever saved by believing a lie. But many have been, have taken the path to hell by believing a lie. Okay? That's why this is important. It's not a matter of us saying we're better than anybody else. It's a matter of us saying only God's word is better than anything else. It's the only thing that saves us. Why would we give it up? And here's where I like the, the image of a rope. Let's say you're dangling off a cliff about to die, and someone throws you a rope. Is there any thread of that rope that is unimportant to you at that point? Can someone say, can the guy holding the rope say, hey, I'm going to take out my pocket knife. We don't need this outer layer. While you're dangling, does that make sense? No. The whole rope is important. Each individual thread working together makes one solid lifeline. And if you start cutting them away, then you're only putting your soul in danger. And that's why this isn't just about a trivial matter. This is about our salvation, because only God's word saves. Only the truth saves. So, um, that's the first point. We got these ambiguities in, in the joint statement. Um, and it was, a, it, it was very confusing the way the joint statement was written, because the joint statement itself ended up inserting the, the concept of admonition into the section dealing with false teachers. And it tried to say, hey, they're two different things, but it never actually said that. It never actually said, hey, admonition only applies to weak brothers. Avoiding only applies to false teachers. Um, 
So the paragraph under number one, the full paragraph there, differences in understanding and application of a foundational passage such as Romans 16, 17 constitute a doctrinal difference. Um, so if, if I take these words here and I say, okay, by Mark, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mean, let's say, cheeseburgers. And by a boy, I'm going to mean, uh, make sure there are no leftovers. And then I do that. I go and find a cheeseburger, and I eat it all up. And I say, well, that's what God's Word told me to do. Wouldn't you say, what? That's not what this tells you to do. So if you take these words at face value, as God has given them to us, what do you do? You watch out for, you take note of, you mark. That's what marking means here. Um, that's the old King James Version, by the way. It doesn't mean like branding. It means the word mark there. Mental hmm? understanding. Like. Kind of. It's This word is actually um, a word that is related to what a con artist would do. He, he spots his mark, and he watches his mark. He's looking for someone who would be easy to deceive. Okay? That's what a con artist is. So you can't understand this word correctly as long as that's what you're understanding. It doesn't mean mark as in, I'm going to put a mark on them. Or I'm going to brand them. That's not it. It's the concept of, of looking out for and watching closely. So that's what that means. Avoid? That's easy, right? Stay away from them. Keep away from them. Um, these words are very simple and as soon as you start messing it up as soon as you start adding a different understanding and then start actually doing that wrong understanding that is a doctrinal difference um, and the Wells and the ELS did do that and they have done it um, in, in the past they, they're still doing it in regards to some things um, for example um Membership in Thrivent. Now, see, that one can become kind of more of a minute issue. I hate to use that. It's minute in this sense. Scripture doesn't speak about Thrivent. But when you start examining it, you see that it actually falls into this category of the things that God is talking about. So the Wells and ELS have continued to belong to organizations such as Thrivent. And, and they do so because they say, well, um, we can belong to that organization as long as, you know, we continue to preach the truth ourselves and, and let them know we're not going to go with everything they say. Well, that's what they did with the Missouri Senate. Now, it's worse than that. In some of their foreign mission um, um, work, they would be in fellowship with, with foreign churches that are in fellowship with other false churches that the Wells recognizes to be false teaching, which themselves are in fellowship with other, even worse false teaching churches, but the Wells still remains in fellowship with their church, with that other church. Um, so that tells you that the Wells sees a, the Wells holds to a problem there, too, in regards to whether or not they aren't they aren't disciplining churches, their brothers and sisters in the Lord, as weak brothers, they're just main, remaining in fellowship with them while they're remaining in fellowship with false teachers. There's a problem there. So it's not just this was all back in the 50s and early 60s. It's continued, and it reveals itself, and it reveals itself even further. For example. Just last year, the Wells and ELS had the Missouri Synod president come and address their convention. So one that they recognized to be a false teacher to come and um, address them. Now it's interesting, one of the things he did say was, you know, the CLC was right back then. He did say that um, while he was addressing the Wells and ELS. But how they can't see, okay, they were right back then 
to either the Missouri Senate now doing it right or the Wisconsin Senate even doing it right. Just, it's just convoluted. And this isn't a matter about who's right or who's wrong. It's about each scripture right. Right. Anyhow, um, let's go to number two. This is, again, these are the three requirements in order for us to consider this matter to be resolved between us and the Wells and ELS. It is necessary that the Wells and ELS reject past official synodical statements on this subject which disagree with the doctrine of Scripture. And they are unwilling to do that. They're unwilling to say, Mark, admonish a boy, is not scripture. And here's how they get, here's how they conclude that. They say, well, we don't know what that person meant. What difference does it matter what the person meant? Is that what scripture means? We're not asking you to condemn a person to hell who said, who said that, or even a whole church body who adopted it. We're asking you, is that what scripture says? And they're unwilling to reject it, and they have it, they have it throughout their um, throughout their literature, and then they, it's even worse because they go one step further and say, you know, we're not even going to worry about it unless you guys decide you're going to be in fellowship with us. Then we'll talk about it. Well, if it's wrong, whether you're in fellowship with them or not, shouldn't cause them to not correct the problem. And so there's a, a little indication that something doesn't seem right here yet. Um, and so the paragraph under number two, this is not a matter of insisting on agreement concerning the history of the breakup of the synodical conference. It is a matter of understanding words. Truth and error are contained in words. And if the plain meaning of words is contrary, contrary to scripture, they are false no matter when they are said or how they are explained. Despite differing historical interpretations, we should be able to state that an error is an error. As C.P. Krauth wrote in the Conservative Reformation in its theology, which, by the way, this guy was a Wells guy from back in the early 1900s, men must be honest in their difference if they are ever to be honest in their agreement. In other words, any agreement that says, hey, we're, any statement that says, hey, we're now in agreement, without actually addressing what the difference was, is a little bit questionable. Um, you know who else did that? How long ago was it? The, the joint statement on justification that the ELCA, the largest Lutheran church body in the, in the world, um, also in America, um, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. And there are some other Lutheran churches involved too. I don't remember how many. Um, some foreign ones. They got together with the Roman Catholic Church and wrote this united statement on the doctrine of justification and said, hey, we're all in agreement now. And you know what the Roman Catholic Church said after that? They said, this does not constitute any change on the Roman Catholic Church's part. In other words, the Roman Catholic Church has always been teaching that you are justified not only by your faith, you're justified by your works, that you have to do good works in order to be saved. And that's contrary to Scripture. And the ELCA didn't deal with that. They just said, okay, we're now in agreement but they didn't address the difference between Lutheranism and Catholicism. And so it was a junk statement. And anybody who, um, who has any degree of integrity can see that. Well, that's kind of the issue here, too. Let's acknowledge what the difference has been and, in all honesty, continues to be so that we can get to, so that when we come up with a statement, if we are ever in agreement, it will be a solid statement. And that's what C.P. Krauth is talking about here. Men must be honest in, the in their difference 
if they are ever to be honest in their agreement. Third point, it is necessary that current official synodical statements that conflict with the doctrine of Scripture are removed or corrected, not merely annotated in online format. That's um, something, that's one of the, the tricks that they've kind of used. Um, they have a lot of publications, um, especially on the internet, where the, the blatant false doctrine is there. And then they'll put an asterisk or a footnote beside it, leaving the false doctrine there, then put a footnote beside it, and when you go look at the footnote, it says, for a clearer explanation of these words, refer to the joint statement. Well, the joint statement wasn't all that clear, first of all. But even if it was, that doesn't take away the presenting of false doctrine. And so, if it if you're really in agreement with us, then the false doctrine has to go away. Um, as this next paragraph says, Scripture emphasizes the need to reject all sin and error. The statement, do you not know that a little leaven, leavens the whole lump, is a stark warning concerning false teaching. Psalm 119 verse 128 also says, therefore I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. Um, it's not enough just to say, yeah, we agree, when you still have statements that you're not actually correcting. Um, I'm going to go to the conclusion here. In, in conclusion, should by God's grace agreement be reached on this doctrine, it would remove one of the obstacles that prevents fellowship between our church bodies. However, several other issues concerning doctrine and practice require further discussion and agreement on the basis of Scripture before fellowship could be established. So this, is, this isn't the only doctrinal difference between us and the Wells and the OS. This is just the first one that arose. There's others after that. Um, those would include matters such as state of confession. A state of confession is just a, a term that somebody used to actually practice the false doctrine that the Wells and the ELS engaged in. They, what they essentially did, the state of confession is, okay, we don't like what you did here, but we're going to remain in fellowship with you um, for a time until we determine it's the right time for us to leave. Um, and then the Wells kind of took on that, that approach to dealing with false teachers. Remain in confession with them until you determine it's time to leave. So that's that one. Membership in Thrivent, we talked about that. And then you've got the, the role of women in society. There are a few others that are a cause of concern yet, um, but we're not um, completely sure what their positions are. For example, um, this is just anecdotal, but it, it has been contended by some that the ELS has taken a quasi-open communion position. And what I mean by that is they leave it up to the individual pastors of the congregations to decide if they can commune someone, if someone can come to communion who is not of their fellowship. Um, and, and then the pastors decide this on the basis of just having personal interaction. And they, they talk about Oh, I forget the terms. One is a person's public confession, and the other one is a person's private confession. And those two can be at odds with one another. As long as their private confession is okay, you can commune them. But if their public confession, that is their membership in a false teaching church body, isn't right, that doesn't keep you from being able to commune them. Well, if they are members of a false teaching church body and don't come out of it, that means their pr private confession can't be right either. It's a, it's a st strange distinction that's been, been made. Now, um, this is just, again, this is anecdotal. This is not something that we have um, absolute evidence that the entire church body has have taken that position. Um, but it's something we're looking into. That's on the ELS side. On the 
on the well side, okay, you have this women in society. I, I mentioned that before, where the head of every man or the head of every woman is every man, but we can't practice it because our society doesn't allow us to. Um, that's not that's not scripture at all. First of all, scripture doesn't teach that the head of every woman is every man. But secondly, if scripture teaches it, you better practice it. So there's kind of two false teachings contained in that. So it's not as though if we get this resolved, hey, we're all in agreement. Now the Wells and ELS, that's what they're that's how they're presenting these discussions. When we get this resolved, we're all one big happy family again. Um, and I think these issues are just a demonstration of that passage. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? As soon as you adopt one false teaching and don't contend with it, don't correct it, you're just opening the door for more false teaching, more rationalization, more reasonable. Because that, uh, that issue on uh, communion, that sounds reasonable, doesn't it? You know, as long as that person, just in our private conversation, and we, you know, they say all the right things, why shouldn't I? I mean, they're saying the exact same thing that my members are saying. Why shouldn't I communion? Well, because they're still in fellowship with false teachers. That's why. And it's, that's a serious thing. I don't understand how they <coughs> say that the head of every woman is every man. How they say that's right, but they practice it the actual right way, but still stick with what they say. Like they're saying, yeah, that's that's interesting. Here's the problem with that with that women in society thing is it wasn't. It was kind of a. Well, I don't want to say it this way, but it wasn't as though the entire church body was involved in in coming to that conclusion. That's kind of how the wells have, the wells don't operate that way anymore. Where where the entire church body has a say in what their doctrinal positions are. They deal more with a top-down approach. Um, you know, if a question arises, well, then they have one of their seminary professors or one of their presidents or vice presidents or someone on their board of doctrine write an essay, and then they present that at their convention, and with very little discussion, they approve it. They spend... They spend far more time in their conventions on the physical side of the church than they do on the spiritual side of the church. Um, I'm just going by reports. I've never been there, but I've, I've known people that were members there, members in the wells, and have been at their conventions. And one of them said, you know, we were talking about something doctrinal, and I raised my hand, and I was called on, he said, all the lay people sit way at the back and all the clergy sit way at the front and the sim professors are the front rows and, you know, the boards and everything, they're all in the front rows. And, but this guy raised his hand and the moderator said, okay, that layman back there has a question. And he said, the entire attendance turned around <laughs> to find out which layman would, would have a would have something to say at convention. It's kind of weird. But here's the other thing. Um, not everyone in the wells even are aware of this, this doctrine on the role of women in society. It's not like it's widely published. Just like the joint statement. Um, I've talked to many people in the wells and ELS who've never seen the document. They don't know what their church body approves. It's just not how we operate. Um, so going on, God-pleasing unity in matters of doctrine and practice is and always has been the work of the Holy Spirit through his word alone. All members of the Holy Christian Church, wherever they are found, desire to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace for the building up of the body of Christ. So it's not like we're questioning that about the wells, that, that they don't have a desire to, um, to practice the fellowship that the Holy Spirit creates. Um, but we believe, therefore, that the doctrinal 
differences separating the wells in ELS and the CLC can only be resolved as the Spirit grants to all genuine submission to His clear word, apart from human reason, will, or emotion. So there is, you know, it's not just the reason side, there's an emotional side. And there's an emotional side both directions. You can have an emotional side, and, and many have accused um, some in the CLC of just being emotionally reacting, like we don't want to be with the wells in the ELS. That there's too many bad feelings over time. But don't forget there can be this emotional overreaction the other direction as, so hey, this would be great, let's just all get together, that would be fun. That's an emotional reaction. Um, now that's up for each person to judge their own heart on that, whether or not they're allowing emotion to, to rule them or whether they are only wanting to submit to God's word, I think it is rather unbecoming of any Christian to sit and accuse another Christian of only digging in his heels for the sake of being petty over some hard feelings. I, I just think that's very unbecoming. Uh, to this end, we have presented these three points that our Lord may have all glory and his saving word may be confessed and preserved among us in all its truth and purity. Um, so this isn't about this isn't about just being separate to be separate. Um, this is about the truth. We pray that the Lord will enable to con enable us to continue speaking the truth in love. And if God grants our church bodies full agreement on doctrine and practice, God-pleasing fellowship will be recognized. And from 1 John 1, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we're not saying we're a perfect, this passage is so important because we're not saying we're a perfect church body. We're saying God's teaching, God's truth is perfect. And that's the only perfect thing we have. And we can't let it go. Questions or comments? Okay. Okay. Connected to this is page 32. Um, it's a memorial. It's the only memorial in this, in this, uh, at this convention this year that I'm aware of. Um, no, I heard someone else bring the memorial, but, they, but it didn't get included at CC. I think it is the Board of Missions bring, has brought a memorial. I think it was the Board of Missions. Um... Asking for the, the establishment, yep, that's on page 57. Asking for the establishment of a separate board of education in the church body. Uh, right now we have the, the board of education and publications, and their main job is to produce educational material. The board of missions, after last year's convention, directing them to begin looking into ways to help um, mission congregations established Christian day schools. They decided that was beyond their purview um, and um, would rather it go to a new board created for that purpose. Anyways, so this is the only other memorial in, in at convention this year. This one deals with the issue of, of the talks with the Wells and ELS. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, essentially what it comes down to is, well, just above one and two at the bottom there, um, and this comes from the congregation in Hecla, South Dakota. It says, we protest these ongoing talks with the Wells ELS and request that the CLC men of the Intersynodical Committee no longer claim to act on behalf of our congregation unless they openly recognize that both the attempt to find agreement with false teachers who refuse to recognize our difference as a matter of doctrine, and two, the attempt to determine the doctrine of the Wells ELS as
as if it might be something different than how their official statements and literature plainly read are consistent with Scripture's clear warnings concerning false teachers. Remember, why are we to avoid causes of divisions and offenses? Well, Paul goes on in verse 18. Because, because those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and by their smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. And this is what Hecla is saying is happening. The Wells and the ELS are saying, look, don't pay attention to our history. Don't pay attention to our statements. Just pay attention to what we are right now telling you. And that kind of falls in line with that, um, that quasi-open communion practice we were talking about before. Don't pay attention to my fellowship. Don't pay attention to the things I express agreement to with my church body. Just listen to me right now tell you I agree with you and so you can commune. Um, with the mark and a boy, what is the difference between that and what we're doing with them right now? Nothing. That is what we're doing. I mean, like, it seems like we've been trying this for oh, so long. Oh, I see what you're, your point. That a lot of people, that's, that's kind of the point of this memorial. Hey, we're not really avoiding this as yeah. causes of divisions and offenses. That's not quite true, however. The word avoid doesn't mean entirely avoiding, right? We still go to grandma and grandpa's house and, you know, work with them, go fishing with them. I get that. Um, the avoid is only in the context of being in fellowship. Okay. And we're not in fellowship with them just by having a discussion about doctrinal man. So now, that doesn't mean they're not throwing out smooth words and flattering speech, because that's what false teachers do. <clears throat> right. But, I mean, it's a good question, and that kind of is on the point of, of uh, Hecla's memorial here, um, a Prince of Peace's memorial. Um, well, go to look at the second paragraph there. Since the Wells ELS have refused up to this point to acknowledge that this difference which separates us is a matter of doctrine, uh, that's not the one I'm looking for. Um, okay, it's the one, two, three, four, fifth paragraph, the biggest paragraph, well, the second biggest paragraph on that page. Scripture warns us that false teachers will offer smooth words and flattering speech in order to deceive the heart, deceive hearts into tolerating their error, to engage in ongoing talks and form doctrinal agreements without the recognition of error on the part of the Wells ELS is a grave spiritual danger and thus an unsurprising source of confusion in our own fellowship. Um, so, it's not that they're not speaking smooth words and flattering speech, and it's not as though they're not deceiving through those smooth words and flattering speech. They are. But we at least still aren't doing it. I mean, they don't get to come to us and present, I mean, to all of us, and present their false teaching. We're still keeping them avoided in that sense. They're outside of our fellowship, in other words. Okay. Anything else? Now, there's still a danger in continuing ongoing talks. You know, talks always go one direction. Right? Well, I mean, these kind, these general... That's not true. These kinds of talks generally go in one direction. For example, the Southern Baptist Convention, for the longest time, would not recognize female pastors. But you know what they did? They kept talking about them. And guess what? Now you have women in all in, in Southern Baptist churches all over the place. The Presbyterian Church, last year, two years ago maybe, 
adopted a position on allowing not just homosexuality in general, but allowing homosexual pastors. But that wasn't always their position. They held a, a position that that's not allowed. But you know what they did? They kept talking about it. And once you know what Scripture says, and you continue to have conversations in a way that that just seeks to, okay, look for a loophole. You're, you're setting yourself up for danger. And so there is a danger in having ongoing talks. That's why back in 1992, the convention said, okay, let's not have any more talks with the Wells and ELS until they can recognize this is a doctrinal issue. It's not just a he said, she said issue. It's a doctrinal issue. Anyways, I gotta stop there. Sure,